but I think it's going to be a a year to remember by in a way that 2008 was. In the last three or four years, they created a corporate bond bubble, a sovereign bond bubble, in particular a treasury bond bubble, and they're all going to break. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcade Economics as we are now amazingly into January of 2024, which <laughs> has had the effect of Jim of making him become a bit more mainstream, fit in with the locals and and give me an evil <laughs> glaring stare. So, Jim, it's great to see you now in 2024. I see that still got your sense of humor and you're looking chipper over there and plenty to discuss about what is going on in the world as we kick off a new year and first of all oh. happy new year to you my friend how are you doing today well it's a new year let's hope it's happy because i think it's going to be tumultuous um i really do i think it's going to be a a year to remember by in a way that 2008 was uh i'll speak in plain terms in 2007 and 8, they created a mortgage finance bubble. And in the last three or four years, they created a corporate bond bubble, a sovereign bond bubble, in particular, a treasury bond bubble, and they're all going to break. We're going to have an event that could be something maybe five times more powerful than Lehman. And it has already begun. It's so big an event that it's not going to take a couple of months it's going to take maybe the span of three years, and we're already into it by one or two years. We're in the middle of a, a treasury bond default, and a good indication was back in the end of 2019, uh, we saw a, a blow up of the repo window, and that was the treasury repurchase window. What they did was they had a trillion point four in overnight funding. Think of it kind of like as lubrication for a broken system. And the response was not retirement of the king dollar. The response was the introduction of uh, Corona with, with various additions out of, you know, engineering nuances. And uh, then we got an economic lockdown that made no sense because healthy people don't get quarantined not in normal situations. Um, and then we had the COVID stimulus, nine trillion and two tranches for the big banks. Okay, the following year, I think actually I think it was the end of 2021, uh, we had another event that I think signaled a treasury bond default. And that was the rejection of treasury bills at the Long Beach port. By the way, I've got photographs now that I put into my December report from a client of mine who went on a cruise liner and they spent the night at the Long Beach port and it's empty. The Long Beach porch is empty. The Long Beach port is empty. It's never empty. Um, so the Treasury bill, I believe, is no longer an accepted, a widely accepted currency for trade payment. What I'm leading to is if at the end of 2019, we had problems with the Treasuries, at the end of 2021, we had problems with the Treasuries, then yes, yes, that's it. That's Long Beach, and it's never empty. Um, the response in 2021, turning in the page into 2022, was the Ukraine war. And that, again, facilitated the flow of money without interruption. I, I believe, Chris, we've had three years of a Treasury bond default, and now we're entering the fourth. 2020 was the first. We're entering the fourth year of a treasury bond default. This is going to be a very long process because it's so widely used, the dollar, and it's so deeply ingrained and rooted in all kinds of different systems. Treasuries are in 
central banks. Treasury bonds are the main item in structured finance that you know a whole lot more about than I do. Arbitrage trade, leverage trade, structures. Um, I read something like six months ago that Amundi, which is a $3 trillion French private equity fund, they're in France. And when I read more and more about it, it, it looked, okay, this is like a French BlackRock. They announced back in June they were going to get rid of all their dollar stocks and all their dollar-based bonds. Okay, this is the sort of thing that has to happen when you have a treasury bond default. You don't wake up one morning and say, well, for the next 48 hours, we're going to be managing the default. You wake up and you read a lie and you get told a story. I'll give you one example of lies and stories. Um, the big three automakers, I don't believe went on strike because of higher costs and demands from the labor union for their workers. I think they had interruption in their supply chain because the treasury bill was not accepted. Okay, this is how it works. Your company gets screwed up. It's a big conglomerate. Everything gets messed up regarding payment systems, the supply chain, lots of different levels. And they say, well, gee, let's see if we can maybe have it sound like a worker strike. And they did the same thing in Long Beach. Nothing was moving. So the dock workers went on strike. Were they told by the U.S. Department of Labor to go on strike? I say yes. That's what I say. Okay, so we've got the Treasury bill being rejected and not well comprehended. I find that Americans know very little about the dollar. They know very little about treasuries generally. They know almost nothing about trade payment and they know almost nothing about foreign central bank savings accounts, which are, off, 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 which are often called Forex reserves. Um, I've got a number of clients, Chris, who in the last year have made requests of their financial firm that's managing big money. What can you tell me about troubles in the treasury market? What can you tell me about um, auction challenges for treasuries? What can you tell me about the debt ceiling? And the uniform answer is we don't know anything about that. Okay, this is true all through the financial sector. The agents who are selling debt paper bonds they don't know anything about the bond market. They know how to sell bonds. And they usually sell them to people who are not aware of what's going on. I think we're in the middle of a treasury bond crisis and we've got another six to 10 months to go minimum. But I, I, I'm on record now and I, I will defend my point I believe that by June or sooner, we're going to have a massive credit crisis, bond crisis, bank crisis, all rolled into one. Bank, bond, and U.S. government debt crisis. But by June or earlier, and I've, I've been pleasantly surprised to hear that a couple of other analysts out there have cited an independent and what do you call it, a, a separate forecast of a similar kind. I, I, don't, I don't copy them. I, I do my own work. I have my own colleagues. I have my own research. And I have a lot of people who are on my team. And that's really a big advantage for me. It's not like I'm a one-man shop. I, I'm a one-man shop when it comes to managing the newsletter. But for the research... Golly, I got seven colleagues of a traditional type. I got three or four of a digital type. And I got about 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 clients who are like client buddy research elves. Research elves. Hey, Jim, I thought you might find this interesting. Yeah, thanks. That's great. What do you think it means, Jim? So I write a few comments. They write back and we get a little quick exchange. But the flow of information is tremendous from, it's between 30 and 60 different clients 
who keep in touch and they're multi-year clients. So the big theme, Chris, is we're in a treasury bond default and we're, we're lying and faking the favorable results of auctions, the bond auctions. And my guys are on this like white on rice and we're watching the tick report, Treasury International Capital Tick Report, TIC. And I think we're gonna see a lot of the buddies from the US and England who've lapped up some treasuries recently. I think, I think they're going to see a decline in their tick report for treasury holdings without the benefit of sale. They're just gonna see a decline because they're gonna come back under the table to the US Department of Treasury, the Fed, and their backdoor garbage can window, the ESF, which I really don't care to talk about much. It's a dangerous topic. It's loaded with trillions, and that topic got Rob Kirby murdered. So I'll leave that alone. Yeah, I'll leave that alone. Um, we got faked auction results. We had a lot of good information about strain to the treasury market in August. They were complaining about additional supply for the auction. It went well. Well, of course it goes well if we hand money to our friends to do the bidding. Okay, this is very complex. There is a kill shot. And the kill shot simply stated is that we got about $7 trillion in maturing treasuries that we must roll over this year. Seven trillion in treasuries we must roll over in the next 12 months. Well, add a trillion and a half from the regular deficits and we got to finance eight and a half trillion dollars in the next 12 months. So that's why I say, we're not gonna get out of this alive. We're gonna have tremendous damage. We can't really finance more than 100 or 120 billion a month. We have to finance 700 a month. We're gonna get all kinds of trouble. And what I like to describe it as, Chris, is we got a bond risk. And now, Notice that Fed Powell did his pivot and he's announced that he's going to do three cuts next year. I don't think they'll do three. After they do one, they're going to get a different problem. They'll react by saying, well, we, we're thinking about the second cut. I don't think they'll do a second cut. And simply stated, we've got a bond risk and now they've changed it, converted it to a currency risk with the dollar. The dollar has been going down more than it normally would. Um, and just, this is just a quick look as of today's recording. We have markets pricing in six cuts at the moment you, for 2024. Okay. You watch to see what happens, Chris, after two cuts, if they do a second cut. I think we might see a, a sell-off of foreign holdings. Now, I've come to learn something that's rather, I don't like to use the word tricky. It, it's a subtle distinction. Okay, that, that's a fancy way of saying tricky. Um, the subtle distinction is if a foreign central bank sells treasury bonds and does not keep the proceeds in dollars, then they will reduce their dollar reserves that manages their foreign currency and their currency will go down. Quickly stated, if a foreign central bank sells treasuries and doesn't keep them in the dollar, their currency will go down for reasons to do with their dollar reserves fortifying their currency. But if you got a wealth management fund, like, like Amundi in France, that's their BlackRock, or, or you know a German big pension fund, or a Japanese bank and their private reserves. If they sell a truckload of dollar-based assets, stocks and bonds, they're not a central bank. And they're not managing 
the dollar reserves for their currency. They're managing their client's money. And if they dump the dollar, well, they, they'll be converting it to yen or converting it to euro, and they will go up. So if the central bank dumps treasuries, their currency, like the yen or the euro, will go down. If a private financial firm dumps the dollar, the dollar will take a hit. And that, I think, is what happened in the last several days when the Fed announced that they were going to do a series of rate cuts. This is going to sound a little difficult to swallow, but I think the Suez Canal problems have prompted a pivot by the Fed to cut rates. The Suez problems, I believe, are going to hasten, bring about more quickly, the end of the dollar reserve system and the introduction of gold. The Suez problem is that big. A lot of people think, well, it's just a canal. No, it's not just a canal. It is the lifeline between the Gulf energy sources and Europe. It is uh, the object of insurance company canceled contracts. It is the location where the U.S. military will show that they are not world class. For the last 30 years, the United States has never had a war except a third world nation. We are experts at demolishing third world nations and their military. Remember that blitz with Iraq? Three-day blitz? They did not have air defense. So we demolished Iraq. Hip, hip, hooray. U.S. military is powerful. They knocked out a third world nation without air defense. We got our clock cleaned in Syria because they had Russian air defense. We just had a display recently, again, that the Patriot air defense failed. I, I, I hate to think it, but I expect that we're going to have a U.S. naval vessel sunk in the Red Sea pretty damn soon. We're going after the Houthis of Yemen. And the Houthis, that's a third world nation, but they've got Iran behind them. The Persian military hardware is very close to world class. The Suez Canal is going to bring about <clears throat> a number of changes a number of surrenders and a number of compromises that I think are going to usher in the gold standard. Now, I had a client colleague of mine, you know, he's a paying client, but he sent me something and he put an opinion on it. He said, Jim, look what's happening in Japan just because they're making overtures to join the BRICS. I have not heard that Japan has made overtures to join the BRICS. But I do have wind that they had 30 different earthquakes in a short period of time. And that could be coming from the heavens, from technology rather than from something natural. Okay, so try to join the BRIC. I've been saying now for three months, the Japanese are acting like BRIC nations more than the BRICS nations are. The Japanese have de-dollarized in a manner far more accelerated than any BRICS nation, except Russia about five years ago. Russia five years ago is without precedent. They, they dropped off $165 billion in treasuries in, in the space of something like 18 months. Correct me if I'm off in response to the Maidan 2015 Hillary coup d'etat in Kiev, Ukraine. <clears throat> um, Chris, we've got a multifaceted FUBAR. Multifaceted. And at the center of almost all of it is the unbacked dollar, the, the gargantuan supply of treasuries, the boycott from buyers of treasuries. The bondholders are on strike. The only buyers that I see are buddies to the US, UK, 
operating under the table. I'm going to get some more evidence on those bastards. It's not hard. I mean, how many Americans do you know who are aware of what the tick report is? I might know six. You know, I mean, this, this is obscure information that's going to prove my point where a guy who gets up in the morning and takes the train into South Manhattan to do his bond trading. I don't know that he really watches the tick report much. He'll look for his uh, little daily commentary from the vice presidents and their hacks at the Wall Street Bank. <clears throat> you know, this is going to get really dicey, really dangerous, really fast. Because of the Treasury bond default that they will not be able to conceal much longer. Here's just a funny little fact. What was it? Six months ago, four months ago? We had the debt ceiling problem. I think it was in August, so that's five months ago. Um, did you notice that they did not establish a new debt ceiling? They said, we, we've got a, a movable ceiling. We have a mechanism to make a movable ceiling. Unlimited you, till next year. Unlimited, yeah. Well, I, the way I read it or interpreted it, I could be wrong, is that we can just move it up to whatever we need and ratchet it up. Well, that's what you do in a bond default. We're acting like a bond default. We, we've got a U.S. government duck. It quacks like a defaulting duck. It walks like a defaulting duck. And it looks like a defaulting duck. Okay? So I think we're in a bond default. I, I don't need the U.S. government to admit it because they don't admit jack shit. I look to see the symptoms and the supporting evidence for that. And it's mounting up and getting big. Yeah, and Jim, one thing I was hoping you could touch on along with that, obviously people have been looking at the reverse repo facility, seeing that dwindle down quite rapidly right after the debt ceiling was basically eliminated. Uh, curious if you're expecting that to be a major impact in terms of holding this whole treasury market together. Yeah, in fact, there was something that I saw in a recent article that, that made too much sense. And a couple of my guys made their own comments and said, this is worth watching. The repo volume has come down and it went down another hundred billion in the last ratchet, the last change from the last reading to the current reading. I call it a ratchet. Um, it went down 100, 110 billion. Okay, the, the point of the article and the graph, which is I have in my my hat trick letter for December that was just posted. Sorry, that was my door, it slammed. Um, <clears throat> it extrapolated because it looked like the decline was rather linear, nice and well behaved and declining steadily, not like a curve and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a declining repo volume. And it, and it hits the zero mark in March. Okay, it's called extrapolating. If that trend continues, where it drops the same amount each week, each month, then we're going to be down toward zero around March. And, and that is considered to be something of a lubrication system for the bond market. Okay, well, if they lose the lube, what happens to your car engine if you run out of your oil? You're burning oil, you ran out. I mean, you could extrapolate how much oil do we have? How many cc's do we have oil in the, in the crankcase? Well, we're running out of oil. We're gonna probably run out of oil in about three miles. So three to miles down the road, expect the car to seize up on its engine. Okay, that's pretty much what's happening with the bond market. We're, we're lacking liquidity. We're actually seeing the big banks back out of, um, of bond support. The big banks are not investing in bonds. I don't think their hedge funds are investing much in bonds. And something I left out something way back in uh, the end of 2019, the, the managers of the repo window, which I think is the Fed, they invited hedge funds to be part of the repo process, access to the window. And I asked my smartest guys, my colleague, what's going on? 
And they say, well, Jim, there's something they're doing an arbitrage. They buy treasuries and they short the interest rate swap derivative and they capture 30 basis points. They leverage up 30, 40, 60 fold. Wow, 30 basis point. What happens if you leverage 50 fold on 30 basis points? 50 times three, I think you get 15%. That's your return on your hedge fund. Wacky, lunatic, ill-advised strategy. So they had to extend the repo window to hedge funds or else they were going to be dumping their treasuries and causing a severe problem. So they extended the repo window to hedge fund. And most of them are Wall Street sponsored and managed and denied, <laughs> denied when things go wrong. Oh, we, we didn't know. We just, we just manage their credit and we have a VP, but he doesn't know what they do. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. I get that. I get that. I was born yesterday. I get that. Um, Chris, the, the symptoms of a treasury bond default are in 12 corners. And what I find amazing is that most of the Wall Street gurus and traders and managers that don't know what's going on. It's really quite intriguing. It's, I, I got a quick side story to tell you. Back in 1990 and 1991, I went to five banks in Western Boston, the suburbs of Western Boston called Metro West. I went to five different banks and asked them, how do you determine your 30 year mortgage? They said, it's off the 30 year bond. So I let them mouth off for five minutes to explain their ignorance. And then I said to them when I was ready to leave, well, thank you for your information, but I'd like to tell you that you're incorrect. The 30 year mortgage is based on the 10 year treasury yield. And they said, how could that be? I said, it's easy. The average time for a mortgage holder is 9.7 years. So if someone holds a mortgage for over 10 years, they just roll it over and do another 10 year to back it up. All five banks, all five loan officers got it wrong. Okay, my point is that bank officers don't know the bond market. I learned from a guy named PSEC, you might remember that name, P-E-S-E-K. He had a column in Barron's. And I, I read it every single week for about three straight years. That was part of my education. Um, and remember, I, I don't have an economics degree. I, I have a statistics probability degree. I'm a mathematician. So I'm not limited by the, what do you call it? By the limit, I'm not, I have no limitations Oh, shit. How do I say that? I'm not limited by the shortcomings of economics credentials. I don't have the disadvantage of an economics degree. That's really quite ironic to hear. Um, Chris, I'm looking forward to some fireworks. We've got a number of different indicators that are horrible, like the vestibule for bank failure. What's it called? The bank term program facility or the bank program bank, term bank term funding program that's it bank term funding program which is also uh, I, set to expire in march and certainly was curious to get your thoughts on how they might handle that well i regard that as a vestibule they wanted it to be a facility to prevent bankruptcy for the banks you know failure but what it's turned out to be is a vestibule where you have to do a show and tell of how ruined you are as a bank. So they enter the bank term funding facility, the vestibule, they do a show and tell. And, and the, 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 the remarkable feature there is they get to borrow against their collateral at book value, not market value. Right. And so it tells us who's going to be bankrupt next. It's like, it's a fishbowl. We enter because we're in trouble, but we don't want to tell everybody how bad it is. But then we have to show the volume collectively. So the U.S. banks are down $700 billion in unrealized asset losses, portfolio losses. You know the term convexity mm -hmm. for bond market? 
That is why they're not selling their underwater bonds. If any big bank or any two big banks start selling and realizing the losses from their bond portfolios, which I'm sure are leveraged in a, in a stupid way, it will start a chain reaction. And before you know it, we've got 10% long bond yields. And before you know it, we got three or four failures of Wall Street banks. If they sell their unrealized loss bonds, they realize the loss in the bond. If they realize enough losses in the bond, they're going to have a terrible quarter. They're going to have terrible liquidity. And they're going to, one by one, declare failure while they force a treasury bond default. So that's why they're not selling their underwater bonds, leveraged in a stupid manner. I, I, I venture to say that most of the Wall Street banks are leveraged more than five to one. Those bonds are down 30 and 40 percent minimum. If it's five to one, that's 150 to 200 percent loss on their principal. That's why they're not selling they're bonds that have unrealized losses. They don't want to kill their bank with tremendous vacuum sucking out all their liquidity. And now they're insolvent and illiquid, and therefore they have to declare their bankruptcy. That's why they're not selling their portfolio. And if they do it on a collective basis, okay, that's a macro look. I mean, the micro look. The macro look is the treasury bond had to default. Too many sellers, no buyers. What do you do? There's no buy. Okay, maybe it's so simple, Mark, that the Wall Street banks aren't selling their bond portfolios with unrealized losses because there's no one to sell it to. Yeah, I mean, that raises the question that you talked about earlier of when you have so much debt that's set to be rolled over this year while a lot of the traditional buyers are pulling away does set up for an environment where wonder how all of that's going to be funded. And so you think there is a decent chance that we actually see this overtly unravel this year in 2024? Yeah, it'll be covertly unraveling, not over, covertly filled with lies, filled with comments like the Treasury auction went OK. And, and there was a big tail on the last Treasury auction. You probably know more about this than me, but the tail is the difference between the lowest bid and the average bid. It, it's like the big spread. How how wide was the variation in the bids? They call it the tail. And I, I didn't know what it was. I heard about it years ago. I had forgotten. Um, we're going to lie about the Treasury auctions. We're going to lie about foreign selling. We're going to keep it quiet. We're going to have the back door to the Fed with the ESF buying a lot of Treasury bonds. But they're not going to want to buy a whole lot of treasury bonds, Chris, because what they don't use in that backdoor Fed big account, they can steal multi-trillions. Do they use it for the good of the country or do they steal it? Well, what do you think they're going to do? Are they honest citizens? OK, I think we're going to see an eruption in price inflation from monetizing our debt. I don't think it's going to be overt. I think we're going to see a lot of price inflation. They're going to blame it on the Chinese. They're going to blame it on Russian hacking. They're going to blame it on everything except the real cause, which is we have to monetize our debt because nobody wants to buy our treasury bonds. We're not going to have an easy time financing our deficit this year. We're not going to have any possible success in financing the rollover of seven trillion. Hooey. It's going to be covert. We're going to see price inflation. I'm referring to goods, products, services, and commodities. We might actually see a stock market rally. And it's going to be to obfuscate the problem. We've got a monetary inflation problem. Some of it's going to go to the stock market. And people are going to say, it's a sign that the economy is recovering. It's an absolute lie. 
It's a sign of monetary inflation being diverted into the financial markets. Watch, you know, what was it called? Pac-Man back in 1980, 81 and 82. Um, Pac-Man had this ball bouncing off the wall. Bounce. Okay, we're going to bounce from a bond risk and then we lower interest rates and then we got a currency risk. We stop lowering the rates, we get the bond risk. We maybe cut again, we get a currency risk. And if we get currency risk twice, we're going to get a bond risk and a currency risk without one relieving the other. And that spells bond default. Here's a reason why, very practical reason. I used to be called pragmatic gym in college. Why don't you want to do a math major? Well, because I'd rather do statistics and computer science stuff, programming. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to get a very big problem with financing the US government. We're going to get threats of shutting down a lot of different agencies. And the military will say, you can't shut down. We need our 700 to 800 billion a year. You cannot shut down, monetize the debt. We in the military don't give a rat shit if it's printed money that finances the military complex. We have wars to wage. That's why we will print money and monetize the debt. Because among all the agencies to be shut down is the military and the Pentagon, and they will not be shut down. Well, yeah, that seems to be one of the the things that uh, is going to require money along with Social Security and Medicare, that it's going to be politically very challenging to ever see any change there. And I think you point yes. out the corner that we've we've been in for years, decades of eventually you default or print the money. And I think most of us feel that printing is really to be the option. They in, in every opportunity in the past, we printed money. Okay, so the military is 800 billion. Medicare and Medicaid is 1.3 trillion. So we've got 2 trillion just with the Rockefeller complex and the military complex. And, and those are your fascist elements. I don't want to get too deep into, uh, you know, dangerous territory here. Two trillion right there. There's going to be a lot of pressure to maintain. Uh, I do not believe they're going to eradicate Social Security. I do not believe they're going to eradicate um, military disability. Um, a lot of people might find this difficult to believe, and I really don't care anymore. I'm tired of people who do no research, who do no critical thinking, who accept that two plus two by an economist is equal to five. And they tell me, Jim, you're all wet because I'm busy thinking and working and they're not. We've got a war going on and it's happening underneath the United States. There's a war going on. I've got a new military source, Chris. I'd, I'd rather not talk much about it on this show. Um, I revealed a bunch of the intel on the December report, but um, we are likely to see some action soon to end the current show. This is called the current show. Um, you know, those who saw the Truman Show, the movie with Jim Carrey, what was that, about 15 years ago? Oh. That's a good indication. We've got a show going on, and it might be coming to an end soon. Why? Because we're seeing a bond default. Because we're seeing a Suez Canal interruption to commercial trade. And remember, it was about three years ago, we had something called the Evergrande ship in the Suez Canal that mm -hmm. got beached. It didn't get beached, it got sabotaged. You know, if you put some, let's just say some ordinance, I love that word. You don't have to use the B word. If you got some ordinance and you put it 
on the hull of a container vessel and then you run it off, it sinks. Um, that's what happened to the Evergrande. And there was, uh, let's just say, a lot of little people heading to Rotterdam uh, who were on, in chains. Okay, There's a lot going on in international commerce, global commerce. The Suez is going to be shut down. Uh, it's going to mean a lot of lost revenue for Egypt, and it's going to bring, mean step by step the end of the king dollar as the global currency reserve. So there is part one of this interview with Jim Willie. As often is the case, Jim had plenty to say, so did break this up into two parts. And in the second part, Jim digs into a bit more in terms of what he sees happening in the gold market, also shares his latest thoughts on silver. So stay tuned as that will be coming up in just a couple of days. And real quick before we wrap up, did want to let you know that Miles Franklin does have a silver special running this week. That includes Trump one ounce wanted for president silver bars for only 315 over spot, as well as Noah's Ark one ounce silver coins for 349 over spot. So if you'd like to take advantage of that or have questions about anything that's going on in the gold and silver markets, well, you can just email Arcadia at Miles Franklin. Happy to get back to you with information about that or if you'd like to place an order. And with that said, going to wrap up for today. Hope you're having a great day out there and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>